I'd just like to start by saying thank you to the organisers of ECHA for inviting me to present some early stage research and for giving me a little bit of space to try some new things. I'd also like to say well done for organising this conference. It's clearly so needed at the moment and I'm hoping that it'll be the first of many and I'm really excited to see how our discussions unfold over the coming weeks. The purpose of the talk I'll present is to ask how we can approach artificial intelligence from a conversation analytic perspective. I'll start with a story from one of Sachs's early papers that warns about uncritically imposing our habitual disciplinary models and research objects into a new field of study. Then I'll talk about some classic ethnomethodological studies of work that already have long established methods for engaging with technology and system design. Then I'll introduce three brief examples from research projects I'm working on where I've been struggling to frame a critical approach to combining CA and AI. These include a project using CA as a method for studying a conversational AI, a project using AI as a tool for doing kind of computer augmented CA, and then a project using AI as both a research object and as a tool. I'll try and use my confusion about how to frame this combination of CA and AI as a starting point for opening up some broader questions for discussion. In his paper on sociological description, Sachs tells a metaphorical story to warn us about basing our research objects and study designs on common sense descriptions of social phenomena. In the story, he talks about three researchers or scientists encountering a mysterious talking and doing machine, an allegory for the human in the human sciences. The common sense description of his talking and doing machines two parts is that one part does some kind of routine task or activity while the other part seems to narrate the action in a strange language. The three researchers who start from this common sense description of talking and doing all fall into the same trap. A linguist who can decipher what the machine is saying but has no idea what it is doing naturally assumes that the function of the machine is to teach people how to do this mysterious task. An engineer who understands the task but not the language assumes that the function of the machine is to teach people how to speak the strange language. And a sociologist, the third scientist, who understands both the task and the language explores the discrepancies between what the machine is saying and what it is observably doing. And in this way, the sociologist theorises, as Sachs puts it, by discovering and reconciling disjuncts between linguistic descriptions and the practical actions of the machine. This is a rather uncharitable characterization of sociology from Sachs's critical perspective. The punchline of his metaphor comes when a fourth observer that Sachs calls a naive scientist who understands neither the language nor the task of the machine and who comes without a common sense dualistic understanding of its talking and doing parts that might lead them to assume that what the machine says and what it does are even separable in the first place. When the naive scientist listens to the careful descriptions and analyses of the linguist and the engineer, is amazed to discover that there's a machine that seems to have been built primarily for the purpose of being studied and described by scientists. Sachs's story illustrates Garfinkel's famous criticism of sociological or psychological models of man, as he calls them. These models exist within the fields of psychology and sociology, primarily to be studied and to be studyable by psychologists and sociologists. Sachs's point is that the first three scientists in his story solve problems of their own making that only become apparent as problems because of how their disciplinary approach, knowledge and conventional research objects carry these kind of common sense descriptions and assumptions. There's been a rich tradition of bringing this ethnomethodological critique to the study of technology design. A classic example of avoiding Sachs's trap and dropping common sense descriptions when approaching a new field came to human factors engineering with the work of Lucy Suchman. Her foundational study of photocopier use versus photocopier design at Xerox Park in the late 1970s show how the plans of the photocopier machine's designers were operating with a very different ontology from the contingent, situated action of the photocopier's users. Button and Sharrock's paper on project work nearly a decade later built on Suchman's research at Xerox and took the ethnomethodological turn of re-specifying questions about the photocopier design, about its hardware and software, as a way of studying the detailed work practices of collaborating software and hardware engineers. 
these kinds of ethnomethodological reframings of research practice that looks reflexively at how people formulate and produce their work hasn't always been a welcome addition to the host discipline. Suchman inspired a small group of PhD researchers at the MIT Media Lab in the mid-80s, including David Chapman and Phil Agre, and helped them to completely respecify their discipline's common sense assumptions about how to frame studies of cognition. Agre later wrote about how this completely altered his approach to research, which had previously been preoccupied with looking through the social science research and then specifying technical mechanisms to implement findings from it, and led to what he called full-blown dissidents within the field of AI. Building on the traditions of ethnomethodological studies of work and technology, such as Goodwin and Goodwin's studies of air traffic control systems or Heath and Luff's work on the London Underground, Button and Durish articulated a similarly dissident approach, combining ethnomethodology with the field of human-computer interaction. Their work pointed out the twin paradoxes of system design and techno-methodology. The paradox of system design is that if we do detailed studies of the work practices associated with technology use, then we use those insights to modify the technology that we've watched people using, then we reflexively modify the detailed practices that generated our insights in the first place. The related paradox of techno-methodology is that without having an existing system and detailed work practices for us to study, where do we even start with system design? Their answer was to sketch out some possibilities for how ethnomethodologists can engage with technology design while maintaining a critical awareness of the very different philosophical underpinnings of the two fields. And this project remains relevant for the meeting points of CA and AI today, especially as these detailed practices of technology use are now so ubiquitous that it's becoming hard not to be consistently engaged with them. The ongoing challenge of using CA to study mysterious talking doing machines is to recognise and accommodate the way that our disciplinary perspectives inevitably bake in common sense descriptions and ontological assumptions into the way that we frame our research and do our study designs. So in the following section, I'm going to talk about three projects that I'm working on that I think exemplify this confusion, each of which adopts a different approach to AI, where I'm still stumbling over my assumptions and how to engage with AI either as a research object or as a research tool or as a ubiquitous feature of both. The first project I'm going to show deals with the most obvious common sense description of AI as a simulation of human behaviour and capabilities, especially conversation. Here's a great example from the Google I.O. conference in 2018, where CEO Sundar Pichai unveiled a remarkably compelling conversational AI named Duplex that was apparently able to make successful service calls to book restaurant tables and salon reservations, etc. Apologies if you've seen this many times before. I think it's worth watching again. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. One curious recurrent feature of Duplex's calls we noticed was the anchor position um. I'll play a few call openings where following the ringing and the service identification greeting, I mean, hello, thanks for calling business name, we hear the caller, in this case duplex, doing a reciprocal greeting, followed by moving on to first topic, the reason for the call, in line five in this case. And what I'd like you to listen for is the um, just before the reason for the call. See how may I hear you? 
Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. Here's another example. Here the entire ring pickup and self-identification sequence has been clipped out of the recording. This was an issue we had with most of the duplex calls that Google themselves released. They didn't put in the business name and they just edited it out without announcing it, which made the data a little bit difficult to deal with. But if you listen carefully with headphones, you can hear how it's been clipped out. Hi, um, I would like to reserve a table for May 25th. Here's a third example, which I'll play and then return to in a moment to look at the full transcript. Here it is. Good evening. Hello? Hello. Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Friday the 3rd. Here's one of the examples that Shegloff uses to show that these ums at anchor position, just before first topic, are a systematic phenomenon. He notes that in this case, in a call to a police dispatch desk, the operator has just put the caller through and then the operator's continuing talk occasions a redoing of the caller's first topic turn, which is aimed at the dispatcher at line five. And the pre-first topic um here then gets redone as a relevant component of the first topic turn. Please, uh, could you uh, go to uh, eleven twenty-five Broadway? Yes, please. Talking out there. Go ahead, sir. Uh, could you go to 1125 Broadway, apartment 5? I'd just like to look at that previous example I played earlier without the beginning of the transcript. And here we see something similar to the displacement of that pre first topic um. The greeting sequence here is expanded because there's a redoing of the summons response pair. So the ringing of the phone and the pickup gets redone at lines 4 and 6. Duplex still positions the um precisely after the reciprocal greeting, just before the reason for the call at line eight. So we can see that this is a systematic phenomenon. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Friday the 3rd. Again, here the anchor position um is positioned after an expanded greeting exchange sequence. How can I help you? Hello? Hello, what's up, man? Hey, um, I wanted to know what are your hours for today? In this example, the anchor position is even further deferred by a pro forma announcement that the call's being recorded, which we see at line seven to eight. This is not the reason for the call, it's an announcement that the call's being recorded. So we see the um reappear at line 10, really demonstrating that this is attached not to just what happens after the greeting exchanges, but specifically to the reason for the call in anchor position. Hello, Boris Solano, may I appear? Hello? Hello? Hi, I'm calling to make a reservation. I'm Google's automated booking service, so I'll record the call. Um, could I book a table for Tuesday the 21st? You may also have noticed that many of these call openings also feature a second summons, as Lee calls them, where the caller answers, says hello often with a self-identification, and then Duplex redoes the summons here at line three. So this seems like a pretty good hack to get around some otherwise complicated bits of speech recognition. People might say restaurant names quite differently, there's a range of lexical choices for summons responses, and there's a lot that can go wrong for an automated speech recognition system. So these second summonses, which are quite common in the small number of calls that we've gathered from Duplex, seem to be a good way to reset the call opening. So where Duplex detects any kind of complexity or has a passing problem, to get back on track with a routine and predictable sequence of actions in the pragmatic context of reservation making, this is a really good tactic. I've highlighted second summonses here because using CA methods to study this conversational AI allows us to identify what the second summonses do interactionally, what they achieve, and this shows us why they're a handy hack for the designers of conversational AIs. But what about the anchor position ums? We can see that duplex produces them and systematically in a routine position. They don't happen on every occasion, but they're very regular, but how are they procedurally consequential for what happens next? And as it turns out, even Shegloff doesn't have a specific analysis as to what this species of ums do interactionally. He uses them to prove a point in an argument, I think it's with Herb Clark, 
to say that ums are used for many more things than signaling delay or uncertainty. Duplex's designers actually say that they insert ums into Duplex's speech to fill time while some particularly complex computational process or search is underway. But this seems unlikely to explain the anchor position ums, since the reason for the call that comes immediately next would always be available to Duplex from the outset of the call. But note also here that what we're now doing is moving away from CA and maybe basing our approach on common sense descriptions of AI and assumptions about how the software may or may not work. And this looks a little bit like the way that in the human sciences, we can sometimes speculate about cognitive functions. If we study these kinds of conversational AIs, like Sachs's linguist or engineer or sociologist, we could easily fall to speculating about how ums relate to processing delays or other cognitive and computational procedures. So we should take Sachs's warnings when we approach AI systems with a dualistic ontology of talking and doing machines, we can easily lose a perfectly good CA phenomenon, which has a precise procedural description, such as anchor position ums. Even without an explanation of what this phenomenon achieves in interaction, we can still learn a lot from the way that we can find it produced systematically in Duplex's recordings. The simple fact that it was classified and reproduced in the correct sequential location by engineers using a recurrent neural network suggests that this kind of AI system could be trained to recognise other seen but unnoticed structural features of talk that, as Sachs puts it, we could not, by imagination, assert were there. While we may have no explicit account for such a phenomenon, we may still be able to use an AI system to identify many more such features that we could then collect and analyze. In other words, to use AI as a tool for doing CA. In this next section, I'm gonna move on to another common sense description of AI as just a tool. This notion is often offered as a deflationary response to the first default description of AI as a simulation of human behavior. And it usually uses less loaded terms than AI. It uses terms like machine learning or even linear regression if it wants to take the piss. This framing invites us to consider AI within ongoing methodological debates about CA's use of different types and arrangements of recording devices, how it deals with mediated interactional materials and settings, and the details of its research practices of collection building and data management, and specifically Jeffersonian transcription. Just as the most obvious common sense description of AI is that it simulates human intelligence, the first assumption that people make about how AI could be used for CA is to automate transcription for the sake of speed, scale, and cost effectiveness. And Galena Bolden points out that although Robert Moore's 2015 pioneering work in this area is one of the rare detailed analytic studies of using automated transcription for CA, most attempts simply ignore the theoretical basis and the analytic value to the research process of doing Jeffersonian transcription. Of course, the standard orthographic transcripts produced by the now many automated services that are available for doing this kind of speech to text, they're not designed to support the practical uses, let alone the status, the exalted status of the transcript in conversation analytic research. Ogden points out that without speech recognition replacing human transcribers, there are still ways that automation could augment at least part of that process. And this is precisely what Umer Mohammed, Julia Mertens and I, uh, working at JP de Reuter's Human Interaction Lab at Tufts, aim to create with Galebot, which is, as far as I know, the first automated transcription system that tries to do Jeffersonian notation. It relies on the back end on IBM's Watson speech-to-text system, but it could use Google's or Microsoft's or any number of similar cloud-based application protocol interfaces to a speech-to-text system to extract, send the audio of each speaker out to the cloud, and then it gets back a basic orthographic transcript with timing data. It then uses a series of these modular processing stages to quite crudely split utterances into turns, annotate overlapping talk, mark faster, or slower or stretched syllables, and then goes through a secondary model that we developed to note where it detects laughter. I'm gonna show a quick example of Galebot's work taken from ideal recording conditions, and then I'll compare uh, her transcripts of some well-used data to manual transcripts by expert analysts to think about how AI in this way may become useful, but could also be approached critically from a methodological standpoint for doing CA.
The first thing to note here is that Galebot is designed for use in the Human Interaction Lab at Tufts, which is an ideal recording condition for it. JP Dorita designed a pair of observation rooms which are separated by a soundproof glass, so the two participants can sit opposite each other at a table and talk into head mics that give the audible impression of being in the same space, but it allows us to record each participant on a separate track. This makes automated transcription far more straightforward because it avoids the diarization problem, which is that it's hard to separate out speaker turns when you've got a mixed audio file. So bear in mind that when you're watching this demo, although it's possible for Galebot to achieve reasonable results using other kinds of recordings, these are made in the best possible conditions. This is one of a corpus of recordings of hundreds of hours of spontaneous talk between Tufts University students, both known and unknown dyads. And the transcript you're seeing is created purely by feeding the video file to Galebot Galebot then produces this time-synchronized transcript in the chat format used by the CLAN line-by-line -line transcription software that some of you may know well. Are you in any clubs or anything? So I am in a Chinese dancing club called mm. Uzi. Oh, that's and fun. like we just, yeah, we do the practice and then we perform some of the Chinese dance that we've practiced. I think we have like... Uh, three shows, big or small, each year. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, we were performing the Parade of Nations, mm -hmm. and like we will have our own showcase maybe next semester, usually in the spring semester. Wow, that's awesome. So you can see there are plenty of lexical errors here. Some are homophones and mishearings that are completely understandable, and they arise from the kinds of short-range prediction errors that AI-based speech-to-text often makes. So you can see here that guessing that after the world called, you're likely to see a proper name like Lucy leads to a transcription error here. However, Watson does allow you to retrain its language model. So we could feed all of the words that we'd transcribed and corrected back into the model that we used to do the transcriptions. And we've retranscribed this a couple of months later and you can see that it produces some corrections, but also some different kinds of errors. So there must be some kind of stochastic process here that I don't fully understand. In a way, that's maybe a little problem to be aware of, that AI systems tend to have this black box feel to them. At first, we followed more in using the common quantitative measure of word error rate that's often used to benchmark standard speech -to text systems. And then we ran Galebot on a range of common data types used in CA and then compared her performance with pre-existing transcripts where possible, such as with Jefferson's original transcripts of Newport Beach. Where there was no transcript, we would get an undergraduate research assistant to produce them, as was the case with the newly created Human Interaction Lab corpus. Galebot's retranscription of the Newport Beach recordings, which are single channel rather than speaker separated and full of static and audio artifacts from poor quality recording, had even more errors than Moore's original test. So we recorded 44.33% uh, word error rate, whereas Moore's use of the IBM Attila system got a 36% WER on the same extracts from the corpus. We also got Galebot Galebot to retranscribe the entire call home corpus, which is an American English corpus of naturalistic phone calls between friends and family. It's often being used for computational linguistics and CA, and it's on TalkBank. And here, each caller's voice is recorded on a separate audio channel. So we're able to get rather more success at 22% WER. And as you can see, the high lab recordings are pretty good and least prone to lexical errors or timing errors, but the word error rate might work for evaluating a standard speech-to-text system that can only do word recognition or, as Moore showed, can also time silences. It's not a good way of measuring the quality of speaker segmentation, overlap, phonetic representation and prosody. Of course, Galebot can't do all those things, but it at least tries to use some of the Jefferson notation to annotate bits and pieces where it can pick them up. So I've started to compare Galebot's call home transcripts with call home transcribed or retranscribed by expert conversation analysts to see, can we use the Galebot transcript to at least identify the phenomenon that is being pointed out by a published paper with a bit of the call home corpus retranscribed in it? Here's a transcript from a paper by Local and Walker, where this extract is used to explain how a standalone so in line 14 on their transcript above is implicated in disengagement from further on-topic talk. This happens just after a storytelling. So if we look at Galebot's transcript underneath, I'll play it through and then talk about what it gets wrong and what it gets right. 
it has an off-board power supply, which they didn't steal, which makes the thing that they stole absolutely worthless. Huh. So. Bizarre, bizarre. So Galebot gets all of the quiet, multi-party laughter and long in-breaths as silence. And so it marks the timing incorrectly. There's a gap which is marked as an extended pause at line 406 of Galebot's transcript here, and one long gap at line 412. But the transcript still provides a tool that could, at least in principle in a data session, be a resource for pointing out and discussing the function of the standalone so. So it's not a complete failure. We at least get that. Here's another transcript by Gary Walker from a paper on how pitch is implicated in the projection of more talk. I'll play it once through and then talk about what I think Gailbot gets wrong and right. I can understand that. I can, yeah. I can understand because that makes you feel like you're it's making like, a choice. So Gailbot's transcripts clearly miss the phenomenon entirely here because they don't annotate pitch or loudness, so they have nothing to say about how pitch projects more talk. However, while we still see some timing and formatting errors, and these are from the complexity of automatically laying out the organization of overlap, the transcript does have some of the sequential features that are implicated in this phenomenon. And in that case, they may turn up in the analysis. This may be useful in a data session. Gail Jefferson is one of my all-time intellectual heroes, so it does make me sad to look at these lovely images of her and realize that she probably would have thought that Gailbot was a terrible idea. And Galena Bolden channels some of what I think her criticisms would be, that these kinds of tools could encourage a tendency to use crude search strategies to interrogate large and unfamiliar corpora and could lead to decontextualized analytic mischaracterizations and confusion. But it is worth mentioning that there is a whole industry of building conversation analytic corpora out of professional transcripts, and many people use research assistants to do transcription. So the same kinds of issues might be raised there, and it's worth thinking them through. As we saw in Gail Bott's retranscription of Local and Walker's example of the standalone so, some phenomena may be amenable to lexical search strategies, and timing and overlap and other markers could be accurate enough. The level of detail provided by Galebot's transcript does allow for the use of more sophisticated search algorithms as well that could take into account both lexical and structural features of talk while using augmented search strategies. And these are really exemplified by the work of Christopher Ruhlman and Horan Musgrave in a re recent paper on using rather sophisticated regular expression searches on corpora. The point here is that when we use and develop software tools for CA, we also need to have a quite clear, critical understanding of the constraints of using them. And it's much like the ongoing debate on coding and quantification and experimental methods in CA that's still been running since Shegloff's original 93 paper on quantification. It might be time to have more of an in-depth discussion about how, as Ogden notes, building software tools specifically for recording, transcribing and analyzing conversation and social interaction could reinforce both technological and theoretical and methodological development. The final project that I'm going to cover in trying to frame an engagement between CA and AI looks at AI both as a topic of research and also as a method for or a tool for gathering data, building collections and doing analysis. And this is part of a participatory research project that involves 15 pairs of disabled people and their carers or personal assistants co-designing the research project. And it involves a variety of research processes, including interviews and also conversation analytic video analysis. I'm going to show an example of some video analysis using data gathered by my father, who's disabled, and his care worker, using voice interfaces and a smart home system that they've co-designed with me that includes a pair of network cameras, and they use these cameras to record episodes within their daily routines and interactions. And then they can review those as a resource to incrementally modify the design of the smart home system, which in turn reflexively modifies the research process and also the work practices. So this is a consummate example of the paradox of techno methodology in action. I'm gonna start by showing you a series of clips that show how Ted, the disabled man, and Mandy, his carer, distribute the work between them in different ways when engaging with an AI-based voice interface, in this case, an Amazon Echo, commonly known as Alexa. So in this first clip, we're gonna see Mandy, Ted's personal assistant, 
leaving Ted alone in his room where an Amazon Echo smart speaker is positioned on his desk. And from this camera angle, you can see its wake light come on when Ted says the name of the virtual assistant Alexa, and then it stays on while it responds to his request to tell him the time. And this clip represents a kind of default use of the device, which is exactly how it's designed to be used by a single user accessing it on their own. It's 3.45 p.m. Here's a second example. Ted's awake, but he's wearing the breathing mask he has to keep on while he's sleeping. Mandy's getting some medical supplies ready for him, but she responds to his muffled question by checking her understanding, and then when no further muffled talk is forthcoming from Ted, she treats that as confirmation and relays the question about what time it is to Alexa on Ted's behalf. So here we can see a different configuration of personal assistant and virtual assistant and the distribution of work between Ted and Mandy. What time? Alexa, what's the time? The time is 11.28 a.m. In this final of the first three examples, we're gonna see Mandy get up from feeding Ted his breakfast and she'll respond to his faintly voiced question about whether they're finished by explaining that her next task within the whole breakfast project is to prepare and give him his medications. So now when Ted asks Alexa the time, it doesn't respond immediately. And while Mandy could, as she did before, step in and intervene on Ted's behalf and ask, she doesn't, she waits. But I want you to just notice how she then glances up the second time Ted says Alexa when he redoes his request. So puts herself in a position to monitor whether the wake light on the Amazon Echo comes on. So is it responding to Ted or not? Have a look. No, not quite. I need to give you some tablets. So here we can see the coordination of the tasks between Ted and Mandy, and it shows how Mandy calibrates her readiness to step in and assist, supporting Ted's independent role within the collaborative project of finishing the breakfast routine. Now we can look at a slightly more complicated example of Ted and Mandy getting ready to get Ted out of bed using a hoist attached to a track in the ceiling. So in order to get Ted into a position to be hoisted, Mandy has to finish pulling these straps around him. Then she has to unlock the bed wheels and then shove the bed underneath the hoist. However, you can also see there's this heater that is currently on and it's plugged into a voice controlled plug socket which is referred to in the smart home system as blue. So to address it, you might say, Alexa, turn on blue or turn off blue. So this heater has to be turned off and moved out of the way before Mandy can push Ted's bed underneath the hoist. And Ted's role in their joint task is to turn off the heater. So what we're gonna see here is the Amazon Echo mishearing Ted's instruction to turn off blue as turn off moon. And we were only able to learn that it was moon rather than blue because they sound a little bit similar on the recording by looking through a log of all the instructions that the Echo has ever heard. And these are stored and searchable on the Amazon website. So since this mishearing of blue was a current rep recurrent problem, after reviewing this incident, we then changed the name of the plug to heater so you could just say turn on or turn off heater. And in the videos that follow, you're gonna see a very clear demonstration of how Mandy supports Ted's independent action within their joint overall project. Let's have a look. Alexa, turn off blue. Sorry, I didn't find a device named blue. Alexa, turn off blue. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to break this down into two halves. So in the first half of the sequence, Ted asks Alexa to turn off the plug blue and Mandy continues to work through her tasks, finishing arranging the straps and then moving around the bed, unlocking the wheels one by one. Note that Alexa here, when 
she fails to find the plug named Moon. She simply gives an account and then goes back to what she was doing before, which was playing music. Alexa, turn off Moon. Sorry, I didn't find a device named Moon. In the second half of the sequence, Ted reissues his request. And this time, if you listen, you'll hear that he upgrades the emphasis to turn off blue. Also note how Mandy suspends her part in their joint task. She waits at the foot of the bed for the heater to be turned off by Ted. And only after he does it, does she then continue, unlock the wheel and then shove the heater under the sofa with her foot. And it shows by doing that, she could easily have turned off the heater with her foot herself. It's got a big power button on the top, but she doesn't do that. Alexa, turn off blue. Okay. I'm going to play that video one more time from a different angle where we can see again that when Mandy suspends her task, foot on the bed, she looks up towards the Echo device while Ted uses it to turn off the heater. Alexa, turn off blue. Sorry, I didn't find a device named Moon. Alexa, turn off Blue. Okay. So I'm interested both in the distribution of work within the overall task of moving the bed and also the distribution of perceptions of what can be seen from which angle and who does what next. There's a lot in there and I'd like to find out more about it as this project develops. It's still very much in its early stages and that's why I'm presenting it because I'm hoping to get from the discussion a sense of how I could use or develop a framework for engaging critically with the smart home system, with the development process that engages these people as participants in formulating both the technology and the ways that they use it and analysing and modifying both their use and the technology itself. I think there's a lot of very complicated ways of approaching this, and I don't think I have my head around it yet. I began this talk with Sax's story about the mysterious talking and doing machine to ask how to approach combining CA and AI without incorporating the most obvious common sense descriptions of artificial intelligence as a simulation of human action or cognition. Then I introduced some of the foundational ethnomethodological work that's developed into a thriving subfield within human-computer interaction, analysing detailed work practices of technology use and design more generally, not necessarily limited to CA. I have noticed that in the examples of my own work that I've shown here, I'm very much engaged with the work practices of CA, i.e. making recordings, building collections, making transcriptions. These are the things I do. And I've often worried that I'm importing my common sense descriptions and disciplinary assumptions, default study designs into my work. For example, I found myself speculating about how a piece of conversational AI was designed rather than just looking at what it manifestly does when I've been disciplined over thousands of data sessions and embarrassing moments in them, never to speculate about what's going on in people's heads. So I feel like I need a far more well thought through critical framework for using CA to engage with AI as a research topic, as a research tool, and increasingly as a ubiquitous feature of both. And this much has been achieved with other analytical frames for CA. In the last half century, CA research has developed different analytical frames to identify interactional resources and map out the broader machinery of social interaction including turn-taking, action formation, sequences, repair, building on the last discovery to make the next. These frames build on a foundation of basic CA that studies routine patterns in what's known as everyday talk, and that notionally consists of naturalistic or the least constrained and unmarked uses of all of these interactional resources. Some of CA's analytical frames have maintained a strong ethnomethodological commitment to re-specifying common sense descriptions as resources for action. And a good example of this is the CA frame of institutional talk, which re-specifies common sense social science descriptions of institutional context. 
When these are used, as they generally are in social sciences, as a bucket theory, they simply assert the relevance of a particular institution, usually because you end up in a brick and mortar instantiation of that institution. CA, however, demonstrates how the relevance of that institution has to be achieved interactionally, how it has to be talked into being, as Heritage puts it. So less ethnomethodological purist frames also exist, and these would include sort of technical analytical operations such as statistical analysis that we can use to study talk, but participants clearly don't use them as resources for sense making in live interaction as such. But we can't all go around re-specifying things whenever we feel like it. In practice, most CA researchers are embedded within, for example, medical sociology, applied linguistics and communication, HCI, education research, and we find ourselves constantly shifting between common sense and ethnomethodological frames for our work. So I think the challenge for CA researchers engaging with AI is to take into account the methodological implications of shifting between using common sense descriptions and ethnomethodological respecifications. To do that with AI, to frame it, as an approach within CA, we'd need to develop the kind of discourse around it that's been very effective in beginning to clarify methodological issues associated with quantification and coding in social sciences and in CA in particular, and what the implications of using those methods are in practice. Without that kind of framing for CA engagement with AI, I found it all too easy to fall victim to what Phil Brooker and colleagues in a recent paper on the challenges of developing ethnomethodological research in AI call the perils of anthropomorphic description. However, I would note that in his lectures, Sachs also recognises that all research, to some extent, anthropomorphizes its research objects. And he says, given that his research focuses on conversation, that I guess it's OK to anthropomorphize humans. He says this for the sake of analytic convenience. And it's especially convenient and fun, actually, to use CA to work on conversational AI because the material of talk and interaction that is often aped by these machines, is so amenable to CA's well-established methods and well-oiled research cycles. So there's some brilliant CA work out there already, some of it represented at this conference, and I hope that through discussions we can figure out how that work might fit together. Thank you very much. Hello, don't shut the video yet. I just wanted to leave a quick additional voiceover note to thank all my teammates in the various different projects. So for the conversational AI project looking at Google Duplex, that was work done with Elizabeth Stokoe and William Housley. It's ongoing. Um, I worked on the AI Disability and Social Care Project with Donald Hislop in Aberdeen, Elizabeth Stokoe, Dawson Gruber and Crispin Coombs at Loughborough, and Mark Harrison from Social Action Research. And then, of course, Galebot is produced by the Human Interaction Lab, which is run by JP Dorita. And uh, Julia Mertens and Mohamed Ume have been working really hard on it, and they've just got a preprint out. So you can have a look on Twitter at JP's Twitter feed to find a link to that. Apart from that, I've put all my references on my website rather than crowding them all onto a few frames of video. And I didn't always note them while I was speaking the references because I was playing bits of video and trying out some crazy stuff with recording these video presentations. So it may not have been referenced in quite the way that a normal academic presentation would be. You'll find all the references and sources for the videos that I used on my website. Thank you very much again.